Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm going to review the Black Phone, uh, 2021, I think it came out, but it was released, like, theatrically, uh, 2022, back in June, I think. Um, this is going to have spoilers in it, so if you haven't seen the movie, don't watch this. Uh, or if you don't care, then you're fine. Um, I wrote a list of things down here, which I normally don't do, but there, I had a, a lot of thoughts about this movie. Um, first off, I want to say this movie is based on the short story by... Joe Hill, um, which is from a short story collection called 20th Century Ghosts, which I actually have here. And I'd like to show you the cover. It's now called The Black Phone Stories, and under here it says, you know, originally published as 20th Century Ghosts, because tie-in cover. I mean, I like the story of The Black Phone, but there's way better stories in here than that. We'll review this entire book at a, at a later point. It's excellent, but we'll do it at another point. I hate tie-in covers. I just wanted to say that. If you read the Black Phone story, it's just it's just it's not even remotely what this character look. He doesn't even wear a mask in the in the in the story. It's just I hate tie-in covers. I hate them. I hate tie-in covers. Anyways, this was directed by Scott Derrickson, who directed Sinister, 2011 or 12. I like that movie. I don't know who produced this, if it was James Wan or what, if it was Lionsgate. I'm not sure, but it, it very much, this whole movie feels like Lionsgate, James Wan style. Like, if you've seen The Conjuring, Insidious, Sinister, it's that kind of vibe, this is one of those movies. It feels like that. But honestly, I think it took things a little further, and it's not as, like, spooky haunted house vibe as a lot of those are. This has a more grounded, serious tone. And... I'll just tell you right off the bat, I gave this movie like a three and a half out of five, and I actually really liked it. I I was surprised, and as always is the case, when I finish a book or a movie, I like to read reviews from other people, watch reviews. I normally don't change my mind, but I just like seeing other people's points of view, and one of the things I saw with this a lot of is like, it was just kind of strange. Like, it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be, it was strange. And the grabber, you know, the this guy, they just didn't show a lot of him. And we didn't get a lot of backstory behind him. That's what I saw. And also, that's what some of my friends said who saw this. I didn't really get spoiled by the movie, but that's what some people said. And after, I, I really liked this. I thought it was good. I, I'll tell you why I didn't give it five stars, but we'll get to that. I mean, and that's fine. Like, three out of five, That's to me, that's a good score. Um, first off, this very, very accurately, uh, pays tribute to the source material. And I find in general, like, that barely ever happens. Uh, but especially with a short story, that's a really big feat to accomplish. I'm not a really even generally a fan of movie adaptions. I'm not really a, a fan of movie adaptions of books in general. But of short stories, that's really hard to do. And I often don't like it because... There's not enough material there for a full-length movie. So you know that they have to make something up. And then I feel like, whoa, like you, you're you making shit up now. And it needs, to, like, can, do you think that you can make stuff up as good as the author did? Because it's got to match that level of quality. And it's got to flow. And I just generally feel like it's not a good idea. And I feel like they pretty much nailed it. I mean, I really think they did a good job. First off, like, it's shocking to me that they, I, I thought, okay, he's wearing a creepy mask. Like, He's not like that in the book. I mean, it's a 20-page story, but I thought, what are, they're going to do like what they did with it, where they just turn it into a slasher, thrills and kills thing. And they didn't. They really didn't. And honestly, the mask aspect, I really liked. We'll get into that too, but I just thought it was a very good adaption. And I think the things that they added, I had a couple qualms here and there, but I really think that they did a pretty smart job at fleshing it out. And I can see why people didn't like this. I get it, but this is like scary and i mean it's not like nothing movies and books don't really scare me you know what i mean but like it's ter it's kind of terrifying like it's scary and it's intense and dark very dark um and serious and kind of oddly grounded i mean i'm sure you've seen the supernatural aspect of this of these dead kids calling our captive kid you know our our main character finney on the phone but it's like this book is way, or this movie is way bigger than the story, which is how the book is. It's not like highly literary, like it's a very easy read, but there's more going on than the story, you know. 
Like, Joe Hill was clearly trying to say something in a short amount of time, and I think he did. And this movie kind of does that, too. I normally don't talk about plot, because it's like, if you saw the movie, then, like, unless you ha can't remember things, you know what the plot is. But let's talk about some of the acting. Um, and I apologize that I keep looking down here. It's my my list. Cheat sheet. Mason Thames played Finney. This kid was so the the this movie's mostly children. Like there's adults in it, but it's it's this is a, a child movie. Uh, the the child actors are the stars of the show here. They get the most screen time. They they're in, in your face the whole movie. Mason Thames as Finney was okay. Now, I know it's not generally polite to critique child actors, and I get it. I'm myself, I'm a little more lenient with child actors, I get it. But they're still in the movie, you know? And it's not like this is a kid's movie. This is an adult movie intended for adults to watch. It's very adult. So, you know, like, there, it, we're, there's going to be some critiquing going on. His acting was a little weak at times. Like, his reactions to things and just some of his line delivery was kind of like, I think you guys could have done better. You know? I just, that's how I felt. Especially for the main character. The kid was pretty good, though. You know? Like, all things considered. This is tough subject matter for kids to be acting out. Um, his sister in this movie, Gwen, who is played by Madeline McGraw, was probably the best child actress I've seen. And I can't, I can't even, I can't tell you anything... I've seen with a better child actress, to be honest. I'm sure there are, but her acting was was astonishingly good. I mean, better than some of the adults in this movie. Better than adults I've seen normally. Um, this this little girl, I don't know how old she was. She looked like she was like 12. This kid's going places, man. I mean, her acting was nuts in this movie. Watch this movie just for her acting, if anything. There's some scenes in this that are really hard to watch, and at times I was like, this movie better not fucking blow it. Because if it does, this kind of feels exploitative. Um, like, the child abuse scenes in this are really graphic. And, like, I've seen it, I've seen messed up stuff, and I don't ever want to censor anybody. Like, I would never be like, you shouldn't be putting this in your movies, because you, you do what you want, right? And if I don't like it, I won't watch it. But when you put stuff like child abuse or drug abuse or things like that in your movies, it can be a cheap way to amp up the seriousness like look, look take this seriously look how serious it is um so it's like you have to not fuck it up or else it just feels cheap um and i think they did a pretty good job actually it, it's very graphic like they, these two kids because in the in the book you know again the book is very short so you get just enough like the book the story is great you get just enough for a short story to just know what's going on it's very well written so his sister is mentioned, but it's so brief. You just know he has a sister who's looking for him, that he cares about, that he has a nice connection with. So the way that they decided to show that in the film was that they bond through child abuse. Like, they both are abused by their father. And I, at the beginning, I thought, that's kind of a cheap way to do it. And, like, you know, kids know the difference between right and wrong, especially child actors, you know, hopefully. But that's, like, still serious to put those child actors through those scenes. But as graphic as they are, because they are, like, I'm like, okay, they're hinting at their an abusive thing with their parents, you know, with their dad, he's abusive, and then the dad just starts beating the shit out of this little girl, like, brutally with a belt, and it goes on and on. I think it was a little too long, honestly, like, they could have, like, shortened it a little bit, but this girl, holy smokes, man, you would have thought that this was really happening. She's a great actress, and then she has some great funny lines that I didn't think we're out of place. I thought they were just enough. It was really good. Not pleasant to watch, but like really good acting. So then we get to this kid getting kidnapped by the grabber and put in this basement. And Ethan Hawke. All right, Ethan Hawke as the grabber. And now I could be wrong, but I was pretty sure Ethan Hawke said he was never going to play a villain. That's what I thought he said. When I Okay, Ethan Hawke did a great job. I, you might disagree with me, but... I was captivated by his performance in this movie. And keep in mind, remember, this movie is not a masterpiece. This is not going to win an Academy Award. I would have given it a higher rating if it was that kind of movie. But it it just, it had some issues. Uh, don't worry, I'll ramble into those issues. But there were so many more 
good things about this movie than bad. And like Ethan Hawke's performance at first was very in the book. He's this grotesquely large fat man. And, and I was like, okay, Ethan Hawke is not like that. And he's wearing a mask and he's a magician. He was a clown in the book. So making him a magician, I didn't think was a big deal. Um, I mean, it's all very brief. Like this movie is like very almost stylized to a degree, to a degree. There's like super eight style film shots that are like interspersed and like, you're like, what the fuck is going on? Trying to mimic the like feeling of being kidnapped kind of reminded me of the sinister short films in a way. Um, I, honestly, like a lot of like this movie, I think people were expecting like just more insanity from Ethan Hawke. And I'm like, this movie's not about Ethan Hawke though. This isn't the grabber movie. This is a movie about an abused boy that gets kidnapped and how he kind of overcomes his abuse. This is why I think that the story of, like, the overall, just the overall, this movie is bigger than its story, and that's how the book was. So I think that's why people were disappointed, but why I loved it, because I really felt like they paid tribute to that. And as a matter of fact, like, again, we'll get into it, but the the, the studio told, I think it was Blumhouse, actually, I, now I'm, I'm saying Lionsgate, it might be Blumhouse, I don't fucking know, but they told the director you got to put more scenes of the grabber in here. Like we want some backstory. And he was like, oh, well, I'm actually not fucking doing that. So where do we go from here? And they just said, okay. And they let him do it. So I'm very glad that worked out. But Ethan Hawke's performance is freaky. Like campy at times, like verging on camp at times. And I think it worked very well because watching him, I was just like, I would not want to be in the same room as this dude. Like he... He, he plays this kidnapper almost in a realistic way. Like, if you think about it, like, we watch so many movies that we get desensitized to portrayals of things and then being, over like, cartoonishly over the top. Not, like, not campy over the top, just, like, super evil or very aggressive and alpha. And, and he plays this, I thought, pretty realistic. Like, the kind of people that kidnap kids are fucking maniacs, right? Like, in, like, literally maniacs, like, people that are not right in the head. And he really did play this role like somebody who is just very not right in the head. He's very pervy, like, pedoph he's got, there's, like, pedophilia implied. He's very effeminate and flamboyant around this kid and very, like, oh, I won't hurt you. It's okay. And just, like, giggling like a kid. He's got this childlike demeanor to him. Very creepy. And the mask thing worked because the mask is two parts, so when he wants to be you know, that kind of campy sort of childlike character, you see his eyes. He takes the top part off and, and you just see his eyes and that way he can emote with his eyes. And then when he's the, the really like brutal, like, whoa, scary, he puts the whole thing on with the horns. And I thought it was really good. Um, some They did add some stuff, like talking about stuff they added, a really interesting thing. I'm going to talk about this one scene that I thought was kind of funny. Not funny, I actually thought it was kind of scary, but... I'll tell you why I thought it was kind of funny. Um, you know, th these kids call... There's a, a phone that never works in the basement. And these kids call Finney that are victims of the grabber from beyond or somewhere. And they tell him... They give him clues and stuff like that. And this is the kind of movie where you can easily fall into the trap of, like, just honing in on that and being like, this is supernatural. Like, what's going to happen? You know, it's like, this is beyond that. Like, it, it doesn't... It almost doesn't matter, you know, and that's kind of how the book felt. And I know that that uh, Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, and I, I often try to separate the two. I often think Joe Hill is a better writer at times, but the, the supernatural aspect of this does feel like King supernatural at times where it doesn't even matter if it's supernatural or not. Like the supernatural aspect is almost like grounded even though it's not real and it feels like it doesn't, it just doesn't matter. It's like a, it's not a plot device, but it's like, it's just a theme. It's just something to think about. And they kind of did do a pretty good job at that. Like, so these kids, okay, let, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let me get back to the point, the, this weird Ethan Hawke scene. The kid tells him, you know, he hasn't killed you because you're not playing his game. He plays this game called Naughty Boy where, you know, he's nice to you and everything, and then he tests you by trying to see if you'll be naughty. Like, he brings him food and leaves the door unlocked, and he warns him, don't go upstairs, because he wants you to go upstairs, and then he has an excuse to beat you because you broke the rules. That starts the whole thing, and then he's going to kill you eventually. So he hasn't killed you yet because you're, you're not playing the rules. You're not trying to escape. 
you haven't overcome this abuse yet. And the kid works through all this. And he tells him that, and the kid's like, all right, I probably shouldn't go upstairs. And then they cut to a shot of Ethan Hawke sitting in the kitchen waiting for this kid to come upstairs with the full mask on. And, if, and he has his shirt off. And I know I, this part got spoiled, not the context of it, but I just heard, you know, Ethan Hawke has his shirt off. I get it. Ethan Hawke's a good looking dude. He's, he's ripped. I get it. Right. And I'm sure that they put that shot in there to show Ethan Hawke with his shirt off. I get it. But it's almost like a made a mockery of now. And I'm like, that scene was really scary. I mean, it didn't terrify. Like I wasn't like, couldn't go to bed, but I thought it was a very effective scene. And I think having a shirt off worked. I did because it just going from that very weird pedophile, like school kid kind of vibe to this, this motherfucker will murder you. It was creepy. And the way talking about the times that this pushes further than you would expect for a movie like this. When the kid describes what he does, he basically says he beats you with a belt so bad. He just keeps beating you and beating you till you pass out. And it hurts so bad. It hurts. It hurts. And you tell him to stop and stop. And he does. It's just very graphic. Like, I'm like, holy shit. So I thought this movie had flashes of like brilliance at times, like really good stuff. Some lemon lime seltzer today. There's also coffee that I'm propping my phone up on because high production values here. Um, there's some more I could talk about. Let, let's see. Okay. Uh, let, let's quickly talk about the things I didn't like. Cause there's actually very few things. First, the music, the music is completely serviceable. Um, but that's not good enough for me anymore. I'm a musician. Um, serviceable music isn't good enough anymore for me. Uh, other things are, but I'm a musician. Um, I, movies just keep pushing music to the sidelines. It just is becoming more and more, uh, routine formulaic, I'm, I'm tired of this shit. We need to amp it up. The music is very important in a movie. It needs to be respected. Um, and it can change a movie. Uh, the music was not bad. It, it was very synth-like. And I think that uh, Stranger Things is to blame for bringing that kind of... Like, kind of how Hans Zimmer with Batman, like, made that whole style. Ugh. But, yeah. It, it It's okay. Um, and I don't think it's the composer's fault. Like, uh, really, like a lot of times this is the studio saying you need to do this. So he probably did what, uh, uh, Mark Corvin did the music. Uh, but the, mu the music, like if you've seen Sinister, you know, the song that plays when they're looking at, when Ethan Hawke is looking at the, um, home movies, that's a song by Boards of Canada. That's a creep that really made that scene creepy. And this movie needed shit like that. It needed music like that to bring it over the top, you know, it, Music like that in this movie could have really pushed this movie. I think it, that's just my opinion, but I think it could have pushed this movie way further. And you don't get that. You do get a couple cool moments. Like there's a Pink Floyd song used towards the end that was very effective. And I had hoped for more like that, but eh, whatever. He also did the music for Cube, which is great. I don't really remember the music. The Witch, which is great. And The Lighthouse, which you won't believe this, but I still haven't seen. I'm, just, I'm getting to it, I promise. Um, that's the music. It was okay. Eh, I'm going to say not good. I'm, I'm sick of lame ass scores. Um, there's some jump scares in this movie and I'm going to be frank with you. I took a whole star off because of these jump scares. This is not that kind of movie. I, I get why they're in there. I get it. It's Hollywood. They got to do it. I get it. I'm fucking tired of it. This movie, it's inappropriate to put jump scares in a movie like this. And the director of this movie, I think, really knows what this story is about. Like, I really do think it's very clear with how he honored the source material that um, that he really gets this story. Um, you know, not the per a perfect adaption, but he really gets it. And I appreciate that. And these jump scares are just fucking bullshit. I mean, they are. Excuse my language, but... Excuse my language. I swear all the time. Whatever. Um, but... They're, jump scares are not scary. I don't think anyone thinks jump scares are scary unless people all they, they like if unless all you watch is popcorn horror then I don't know, but it's just like a jump scare to me is the equivalent of coming up behind somebody and blowing an air horn off in their ear. Like of course they're going to be startled, but that's all you're doing is startling. That's not terror. So that's horseshit and that should not have been in here and it I honestly I was like I might turn this fucking movie off right now. I got mad. Um and they, there's a couple spots where they show the dead kids, and it felt at times like they were just trying to add a creep factor in. 
And I'm like, I don't think the kids needed to be shown. Um, the aspect of just talking to them on the phone is a really cool idea and sets this apart from some other like standard horror movies. Like remember that this is as this is movie is kind of standard Lionsgate Blumhouse style, but then it has these flashes of a really like out there different thing. And I just think showing the kids was not really a good choice. But at the same time, there was a scene where they showed one kid who was messed up really bad. Like, really bad. And it, I, th I was like, whoa, that's creepy. Eh. And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, yeah, the grabber did that to him. So showing that kid screwed up really bad, really kind of like it's a chilling kind of thing. Like, this kid's in, a, this Finney is in a bad place right now. Like he's in, And he even says that one time. He's like, I'm not getting out of here. It's just, it's there's some good shit in here. Um, what more do I have to say about this? I honestly liked it. And, and I, I said this all has spoilers, but the end of the movie, you know, of any, if you've read the book, you know, he, the book is, is very similar. He, he beats the shit out of the grabber at the end, which is great. He overcomes his abuse and they really did a good job tying that in at the end where the dad breaks down and apologizes, crying his eyes out to his kids. And the kids are like, whatever, fuck you. You know, they hug each other. And I liked that, that they didn't go, they didn't fuck it up and like have them like, oh, it's okay, dad, we forgive you. So I thought that was, the kid came, overcame his abuse. Now, what happens afterwards, we don't know. The The angle with the daughter um, having these visions that she first thinks might be from Jesus. And she says, Jesus, what the fuck? I mean, seriously, what the fuck? That was hilarious. I'm not sure if I dug that angle. Uh, I, I think that was a way to get them to to find the kid. And then it wasn't, you know, then she's like, I don't think Jesus is real. It must be something else. I just, I didn't dig that angle. It could have done without that. I know they needed a reason. I know, I know why they put that in there, but that was another thing where I was like, eh, they could have done something different there. The only other thing I had an issue was, with was James Ransom, who plays Max, which is the grabber's brother. Who is in the book as well. Um, James Ransone, I don't think he's a bad actor, but he plays this little goofy character in all these movies. Like in Sinister, he plays the goofy deputy. And sure, he's fine in that movie. He has some uh, comedic relief. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he has a bigger role in, in, in Sinister 2, which that movie's really not good. And I was like, you guys, like, we don't need to beat a dead horse here. It was a funny little bit part. We don't need to make the whole movie... You know, I, I'm just, that, that shit is played out to me. Like, that joke was fine in the first movie. And he plays essentially the same character in here. Like, he plays, um, he plays Max, who's like a co his cokehead brother, exactly the same as the book, who then discovers Finney in the basement and is promptly axed in the head by the grabber, which, which is exactly what happens in the book. But just his, the, you could just tell that they were doing the same joke again with this character. And I'm like, that shit's not funny. This character doesn't need to be hilarious. It just doesn't need to be like that. Um, I don't know. I just thought that was some boring shit. Um, and then, okay, the only other issue I had was him hitting his brother in the head with the axe. That did not look good. That did not look good. That looked bad. I mean, that looked really bad. They needed to... That needed to be fixed. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. That looked really fake. Um, it was like CGI, composite, some something. Not good. It was not a practical shot. I'm, and if it was, it was the worst take I've ever seen of a practical shot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this movie, I really enjoyed it. It's worth a while. I, I mean, I definitely recommend it. I recommend reading the book. It's it's a twenty page story. You can read it in ten minutes. It's a it's a great little story. They did a great job adapting it. It wasn't an it wasn't a home run pro, uh, production, but it was a great adaption. I enjoyed it. I'll probably watch it again. I don't think I'm going to run out and buy this on Blu-ray, but I I can't say I sat here and was like, oh, I wasted my time. I enjoyed it. I thought it took, I mean, I, I actually, I prefer to see stuff like this. Like, it's not perfect, but they did take some chances. They went a little, almost like overboard sometimes. And I kind of almost, I was like, you know what? Sometimes you got to take your shot, man. And there's some good shit here. So I liked it. And hey, you know what? Ethan Hawke can, can act. 
I mean, I don't know too much about Ethan Hawke. I don't know if he's a hit or miss actor. He was he was perfectly fine in, in Sinister, but I thought he was really good in this movie. I mean, you don't see him a lot, but that's kind of the point, right? That's kind of the point. It mimics what being in that situation would be like as a kid. You don't you don't know shit about this guy. He's a lunatic, and you it's just any time he comes... It's like any time he enters the scene, you're just terrified because this kid, he doesn't know... He has no clue. He doesn't know if the next time he walks in the room is when this guy's going to shoot him in the head. He has no clue. So I like the way it was done. Um, yeah, that's it. Let me know what you thought. Peace out. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.